he laid this message on my heart, and then I heard another pastor preach it, and I was like, he stole my message. But the pastor I heard, but his title was better than mine, so I stole his title. He stole my message, so I stole his title. Sorry, Jeremy Foster, Hope City, Houston, I stole your title. So I'll just clear that, clear that up. So Jeremy Foster, he's the pastor of Hope City Church in, um, in Houston, Texas. They've got multiple sites, and if you've never heard him, Go online and listen to him. The dude is hilarious, but man, is he relevant and, and just strong on the word, preaches the word, word for word. It's just awesome. And I just ran across him one time, and I was like, man, this guy's awesome. But I stole his title. So, uh, Your alignment determines your assignment. Your alignment determines your assignment. So most of us in here have been or are going to be college students at Karis Medical School. We're all, we've all you know, been there and done that. And we've all got an assignment. From the day we were born, the day we were born, God had an assignment and a calling for our lives. Oops, sorry. A assignment for our lives. And he had a calling for us that he meant just for us. But what it takes is for us to get in a line with him to get our assignment straight. So we're going on that straight path. So as you guys know, Pastor Andy's been doing a series on um, faith. And uh, so that's, you know, this is going to kind of go along with that. It's going to be faith because, you know, it takes great faith to walk in Christianity. It takes great faith to walk in believing in Jesus, especially in this world today, who criticizes everything that Christians do. Uh, they, could, they could just, you know, touch anything and become gold, they'll criticize it. They, they don't care. That's just the way this world is getting evil, 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 evil every day. So <clears throat> we need to get in line with God's call in our lives. If he has called you, you know it's a sure thing. God just doesn't call you just to call someone. He's got a plan and a purpose for your life. When we do, God's thoughts and his visions will come alive in us. Also, it's your alignment with the authority in front of you that opens doors that you can't open yourself. So when we get in line with God and recognize that authority in front of us, it can open doors. It's like my brother back here, he's a police officer. Now, he has authority granted to him by the state and by the city of Woodland Park, and he can stop people, he can pull people over, he can tell you what to, you know, he's got that authority, he's got that power. We all have that power when we turn on our cars. We turn on the car, boom, power comes on. We go, we turn on the lights on our house, the power comes on. But it's when we line up with that authority, that authority that's, like he's been granted that authority, when we line up with God's authority in our lives, that's when that power comes. And that's when we just, boom, we can take off. And no doors that we couldn't open ourselves in our natural selves, God is going to open for us. Hallelujah. All right, let's, let's turn to John 14. I can find John 14 and 7. We're going to read verses 7 through 11. John 14. Now I'm going to be reading out a New King's uh, version. New King James. If you know... Well, let me see. Let me start that again. <laughs> if you had known me, you would have known my father also. From now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the father. And it is sufficient for us. Jesus said, I have been with you so long, yet you have not known me, Philip. He's like looking at Philip. Dude, I've been here with you all this time. You haven't recognized the Father working through me? He's just like, whoa. He who has seen me has seen the Father. So can you say, how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority. There's that authority. But the Father who dwells in me does the work. So there's that authority again. The authority of the Father. Jesus couldn't do anything without the authority of the Father in him. Everything he did is what the Father showed him. Everything he did, he's what he saw the Father do. So he had that authority that was granted upon him when he was baptized by John the Baptist, when he was baptized, that the Spirit came upon him, that authority came upon Jesus at the same time. 
And so he had that authority and the power of God in him. And he saw everything that God saw, Jesus saw. And that's how we need to get. Our vision should be like Jesus. What we see, and when we see people, when we look at someone, we should be looking through Jesus' eyes. Looking at them with the love that he has shown upon us. Looking at them with the grace of God. And, and just loving on them. Now, I didn't, did I read all that through 11? Believe in me that I am the Father and the Father in me. Or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. So he was telling him, so if you see the work that I'm doing, isn't that sufficient enough? Aren't you seeing what God is doing through me? The authority that's coming out of me, that's, that's going through? So let's go to John 15, 1 through 5. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already, you are already clean because of the, world, the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. We can do nothing without the authority of Jesus, without the power of Jesus. Now that was, that was another thing too, it was really important when Jesus left, when he went, when he ascended, he told him, go and wait. Terry, for for the power of the Holy, the power on high is going to come upon you. you know, he's waiting, telling them the Holy Spirit's coming. They didn't, they didn't really understand what was going to happen. They didn't know what was exactly what they were waiting for, but they knew something because Jesus, they saw the work in Jesus' life. They saw what he was doing, the authority and the power he had over demons, over sickness and healings. He, they saw that. So they knew when Jesus told them, go and tarry and wait, they knew something greater was coming. And when that came upon them, man, they, they, the world turned upside down. The world turned upside down. It didn't know what to do. It didn't know how to handle these guys. And the devil was running. He knew, now I'm in trouble. He knew he was in trouble because the power that Jesus had in him and authority was now endued on them by the Holy Spirit. It was now flowing through them by the power of the Holy Spirit. And they didn't know how to handle it. You know, let me tell you, the devil, he ran and he ran. But he wasn't going to give up that easy. He was coming after them. He was going to do what he can to trip them up. And we'll see that throughout the Gospels. Now, there's times when, um, when, when you're being led by the Spirit, you have to be spirit sensitive. You have to hear what he's saying and do what he's telling you to do. Um, I remember one time back in the 90s, we were selling our house that we bought um, downtown Colorado Springs by Memorial Park. And <clears throat> we saw this other house we really, really wanted. Man, we wanted that house. We had a contract on it with the contingency to sell with the, um, with the sale of our house. So we, um, so we found this house. We put a contract on it. Well, the day our house sold... They sold the other house under, from underneath us, so we lost that house. I was like, God, what is going on here? We had that house. What's going on? And so we called a realtor, and we were just like beside ourselves. You know, we just sold our house. Now we have nowhere to live. And we have, you know, you're going to close in 30 days, you know. And so we're like rushing around trying to find another house. Well, God led us to another house. Um, and over in Stetson Hills on the east side of Colorado Springs. Let us over to there, and it was a cookie-cutter house. We really didn't want a cookie-cutter house. You know, they all looked the same down the line. The house that we found that we wanted wasn't that, but um, it was sold. So we, so we bought that house. We, it was perfect. It had all the rooms we needed and the square footage we needed. We had three girls, and if you've ever raised three girls, and the closet space they need and the bathrooms they need. I was lucky I got a bathroom, but hey, you know, bless God, he, he I'm going to have a great 
big crown when I get glory. I'll tell you one thing. It's going to have all these jewels on it. Because, you know, God, people say, you know, boys are so hard to raise. I challenge you. I challenge you to raise three girls. The perfume, the makeup, the hairspray. Oh, my Lord. So how this house was set up, there was four bedrooms upstairs. Our master bedroom was set over the garage, so it was down here. And there was a bedroom here, here, a bathroom, and another bedroom. And the stairs was all the way down here. So in the morning, especially on Sundays, I would have to hold my breath from here and run and go downstairs because, let me tell you, the fumes were flying. The hair products was a go. It was amazing. I don't know, man, I should have got me some stock and some hairspray and stuff like that, but Lord Jesus. But anyhow, you know, God had us a purpose for that house, and we didn't know what that purpose was. We knew that. God has there for a purpose. So we aligned ourselves with God. We said, okay, we're here. It's not the, perf not the house we wanted, but it was a nice house, and we're going to be here. Well, our neighbors next door, we became, we, when we bought the house, we noticed there was a gate between, in the backyard, in the fence between our house and their house. We're like, what the dealio is with, with the gate? You know, we couldn't figure that out. Well, they're really close friends with the people who lived there before. But anyhow, we became really close with them. And through that, their son started going to VBS, Vacation Bible School at a church. He wanted to go. And this little kid, Matt, he's just, <laughs> he just told it like it is. He says, Dad, I'm going to church every Sunday. If you mom and dad, you mom don't go, I'm still going. I'll just go with the Hardens. And he was like, all right. So he started going with us. And then they said, you know, they saw a change in their son. They said, we need to go check this out. So they came. And they got saved. Now, if that was the only purpose we were to buy that house that I did not like, that I, I did not want, so be it. You know, but we aligned up with the authority of God. So, said, okay, God, we'll take this house. We want this house. And we were, actually, we were able to minister to quite a few people in that little area that we were, at that time, 98 when we bought that house, the only thing that was out there was our little subdivision and Sky Sox Stadium. That was it. And so in that little subdivision, we got to minister to a lot of people. You know, we saw them come to the Lord, and they got baptized in the Holy Spirit. And there was, you know, it was awesome. And that was the only reason we were supposed to be there. So be it. One other time, too. Now, we weren't living in this house at this time. <clears throat> Everybody who knows me, I'm a Bronco fan. Bronco fan. If you're not a Bronco fan, I'm sorry, you will get saved. We will have an altar call at the end of the service. I'm just saying, if you're a Dallas fan, I don't know what to tell you. But anyhow, we, we were living in another house, and a friend of mine, he said, he called me up and said, hey, it's preseason. He said, hey, Dan, I've got some tickets to preseason game. I can't go. Do you want them? There was four tickets. I was like, do I want them? Yeah, I want them. I'm going to go to this game, man. Yeah, I'm going to go see. It's a preseason game. Who cares? But I wanted to go see the Broncos. And I've been to other Broncos game, but I was like, yeah, I'll go, I'll go, I'll go. But after he gave me the tickets, I was sitting there. I was like, Lord, should I go? And I felt in my spirit, no, you're not supposed to go. I'm like, okay. So my daughter's sitting there. She goes, I want them. We'll all go. <laughs> God ain't telling me that. I was like, okay. So they got, you know, three other, she got three other friends and they went to the game. So the church we were going to at the time had Saturday, Saturday night service and Sunday service. So we decided, let's go to Saturday night service. And I'm glad I didn't go to the Bronco game because I rained on them the whole time. So that was good. But anyhow, we went to Saturday night service. Church was awesome. Had a good time. It was way out east. And at that time, come down Mark Shuffle. Mark Shuffle was just a two-lane road. You know, and I, and I, like, I, like I was telling you, I gave up the tickets to go see my Broncos. And, but I knew God told me not to do it. I was lining up with him. And so we were going home. We are going home. It's late, you know, kind of late, dark, going down Mark Shelf. And I see this car on the side of the road facing the other way, going north. And I was like, man, that just doesn't sound, that just doesn't feel right. Something's wrong there. And I told my wife, I said, I need to turn around. I need to go see what's going on. So we turned around. I went and... Uh, you know, I parked kind of ways from them because, you know, didn't know what was happening. And I, and I get out of the car and I go up and I'm looking in the back seat and 
I see this young lady, laid, she had her seat all the way back, laid out. And I knocked on one, are you okay? And she goes, no, I'm having a heart attack. Now, this is a young lady having a heart attack. She's on the phone with her mom. I grabbed the phone from her. I said, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to hang up. I need to call 911. Now, what if I decided to go to that game? And I said, you know what, God? I want to go because I want to... No, I want to go to this game. It's the Broncos. It's my love Broncos. You know, come on. I got to go see my Broncos. What if I decided not to go? What would happen? Now, could God use someone else? Most likely. But I was the one who told him, yes, I'll go. I line with him. I won't go to the game. But I went. And so I was able to sit there. And then my wife came up. She started ministering to the young lady in the fire department. At that time, <clears throat> If you've been out Mark Shuffle, it's four-lane road, and it's busy and everything. At that time, there was no, nothing out. There was cattle ranches. And uh, so we, you know, she was out in the middle of nowhere, and the fire department's like, where are you? And we're trying to guide them there to us. And they found her, and, you know, as far as I know, I prayed over her, and she, I believe she was healed in Jesus' name. It was done. Never heard anything after that. <clears throat> but that's what I call being aligned with God, being in touch with Him, being in His tune with His Spirit, being in tune with what he wants for our lives. Now, I, I wish I could say I have many more stories like that after that, but I don't. Because then a few things happened in my life, in our lives, and uh, we decided, you know what? Maybe this isn't what it's all about. We got kind of burned by the church. We got hurt. You know, things, I thought things were going well and certain praise and worship teams, I mean, big worship teams where I was co-leading with 4,500 people or so, and, you know, I thought things were good, and the whole world just whoosh, crashed. I was like, no, this is what it's like. Forget this. I don't want nothing to do with this. And so we kind of jumped around from church to church trying to find our home, find our purpose. Okay, God, you know, all these great things happen. We've seen, I've actually seen people healed. Before all this, I saw, I cast a demon out of someone one time. I mean, this... This chick was a demon possessed, man. I don't know if y'all been to like the old churches where they had the big old long altars down at the front, you know, that, you know, people go down and pray. It was Assembly of God Church. This girl, man, she got up and she started screaming. She was no bigger than this, guys. She started screaming and it wasn't her. You could just see it in her eyes. You could see it, hear it in the voice. It wasn't her. She was growling at me. And I'm like, whoa. <laughs> and I just heard God get up and go and, and rebuke that thing. And, and she's crawling at me. And I'm like, whoa, what's going on? And I'm, I'm young. I'm a spitting and, and, you know, just casting this thing. <laughs> and she just keeps crawling towards me. She gets up to that altar, guys. And, I mean, they're solid wood. And I don't know how long. They're probably, probably maybe from the end of those seats to probably about right here. She gets up to that thing and she picks it up. And I just jumped back and said, Whoa, see you later. <laughs> I'm out. <laughs> she said, what is this, WWE going on here? But I was like, no, 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 no. And God said, don't you dare. You use a sword that's within you by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I said, in the name of Jesus, you come out. She dropped that thing and fell on the ground and was calm. And I could tell you many stories up to that point of the young lady in the car. But after that, I can't. <clears throat> Because of things that happen in the church. The devil will try everything he can to steal the word out of you. He will do everything. If he has to use church leaders, if he has to use people in the church, he will. He will destroy you if you let him. You know, my problem was I let my guard down. I took my shield of faith and dropped it. Because I thought, man, life is good. Things are going good. I had a good job. My kids are awesome. Things are good. And I did this. With my shield of faith. The next thing I know, darts are just hitting me. Boom, 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 boom. And then I started letting the, my carnal mind take over and the world thoughts take over and what people thought of me take over and what pastors thought of me take over. And I was like, whoa, what happened? I was doing so good. What happened? But it was me. I got out of that alignment with God. I knew better than that. And it took me some time. And you can ask my wife. There was times I was like, I even told Pastor Andy, I said, I'm never doing praise and worship again. I'm done. You can have it. 
I said, God, if that's how I'm going to be treated, that's how this is going to be, he says, I'm done. He, he, he was like, you need to go back. And this is what God, he says, you need to go back and read about David and how he was treated. You need to go back. He's a man after my own heart. He wrote psalms after psalms after psalms for God and love to, towards God. And go back and see how he was treated. He had armies after him to kill him after he was able to help Saul, King Saul at that time, by playing music for him and soothing his spirit. He was playing, and Saul still wanted to kill him. Still wanted to kill him. And I was like, I know God. That's what they're trying to do to me. I don't want nothing to do with this. You can have it. You want someone to sing? If you want me to sing, I'll sing a country song. And he was like, you're just not getting it. And then after that, I mean, it was pretty intense between me and God. And after that, I just quit hearing from God. Because in my spirit, I was like, I was done. Now, I'm not saying that that was the right thing to do. It wasn't. It was the wrong thing to do. And, you know, then I have to think about everybody else in the Bible who went through worse. And it was mocked and ridiculed and made fun of. And I was like, I have nothing to really complain about because I still had a good job. My kids were a little crazy. It's girls. They were teenagers. So what do you expect? Oh, Lord Jesus. Let me tell you, it was something else. It was something I told my girls. I said, you know what? You will pay. Of course, and they have boys and girls, so they have both. So anyhow, let's, I, I, I digress. Let's go on. <clears throat> Go to Exodus 14, verses 13 through 15. And I know I have it in here in the Bible. And then at this time is when um, the, the Egyptians, you know, they were coming upon the children of Israel. They were, they were having, the, the Israelites were like, oh, freaking out and, they're like, why did we leave Egypt? We should have stayed, you know. We were better off in Egypt. Why are we, you know, leaving out? And look what you brought us out here to kill us. And, um, and Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. Stand still. See that the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you will see again no more and forever. The Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. And the Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel, go forward. And it was like God was telling Moses, Why are you, why are you crying to me? He says, I've given you all the power and authority. I've, get, I've told you what you need to do. Why are you crying to me? You've got the staff. What's going on? Why are you crying to me? He says, I've given, I've told you everything you need. And you're going to let these people who for so long had rejected God, and that's why they ended up in slavery in the first place, why are you going to listen to them and their cries to me? He says, he's telling Moses, do what I tell you. Get in line with me. This is, I'm paraphrasing. Get in line with me. Do what I told you to do and go forward. And that's what he's told him to do. Go forward forward. We need to be, and I believe in here, uh, do, 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 do. I want, there's one passage here I wanted to read. I thought was, um, I think it was right before that he's telling them, you know, he's telling the people to be still and then go forward. A lot of people think, what? He told you, you're telling us to be still, but now you're telling us to go forward. What he was telling them to do, be still in your spirit, relax. Be calm. Know that I'm God. I'm, w I'm with you. I'm for you. And that's what he's trying to tell Moses, too. Now, Moses was not the brightest thing around. I mean, he was raised in royalty. You know, he was up there in the army. He was a general. I mean, he, was, he had things going on. But when God told him to go and, and do what he's doing now, you know, he had thoughts. He, he must have, he had to think Moses sitting here going, there's this big sea, and there's this big army, and there's these people who hate me. What am I supposed to do? 
And that's when, you know, God had to smack him around a little bit and get him realizing what he needs to be doing. We need to fix our thoughts on God thoughts. Think God thoughts. Think grateful thoughts. Think, uh, think of the goodness. You know, a lot of people tell me, I don't know how you can be saved. Or, or, they, or even church people tell me, that faith stuff, I don't believe it. Church people, I go, did it take faith for you to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? It took more faith than that to believe that than it does anything else. Because one, you've never seen Jesus. He's never spoke to you. The only thing you knew about Jesus because he loved you and you felt something. You felt something in your spirit. You felt something. You knew that Jesus was real. You felt it. And it took more faith to do that than anything else that God has commanded us to do. All we have to do is just think about his thoughts. Have God kind of thoughts. Be grateful what God has done. And know that he is God. Realize that this Bible just wasn't put together and written by people to tell great stories. This is a book of decisions. And this book is where we find our answers to multiple things. Through scriptures. How he, I mean, there's scriptures I've read many, many times, multiple times. I've read and read and read. And every time I read them, something new comes alive to me. Something new always comes out. And that's what we need to do. This is a book of decisions. We can make all of our final decisions, buying a house, getting married, um, going, being, God's, you know, moving somewhere. You know, whatever God is telling you to do, you can find the answers right here. We don't always have to be on our knees crying and begging, God, please give me the answers. He's, got, he's given us the answers right here. He's given it right here to us. All we have to do is be willing to open up the word, believe what it says, and ask God, God, what? Ask the what, and he'll give you the why, and you just do it. When you made the decision to follow God, friends and family, co-workers looked at you strange, and some may have even turned their heads like a dog looks at a new gate sometimes. Hmm? You did what? You know how a dog does that sometimes? They tilt their heads at you like, I'm not sure what you're saying to me. But we have to understand, some will be cool with it, some won't, but that's okay. And we have to just be bold in our stand. I've lost friends I thought were my best friends. When I told them, I'm, I believe in Jesus Christ, I, I got born again, and I'm following his ways. I don't drink, I don't cuss, I don't chew, and go with those who do. And I don't do any of that anymore. And they were like, well, we want nothing to do with you. These are the people you thought were, they knew your darkest secrets. They were your best friends. and they just, A lot of churches that way too, believe it or not. But, you know, you're going to have some they're going to say, man, that's awesome. They're going to be your encouragers. They're going to be the ones that are going to build you up. They're going to be the ones that are going to inspire you to be better than who you are right at this time. They're going to be the ones that are going to show you things of God and build you up and make you strong in who you are because God has called you for a purpose. Now, there's going to be haters. And haters will be my elevators. They will, they will inspire. It all depends on how you look at it. If you let the haters come at you and, and talk you down and you let those words get inside, it will bring you down. But if you let those, if you got that shield of faith up and you let those words come and you just knock them off, who cares, who cares? You let those words inspire you to bring you up even further in God, to rise you up to where God wants you to be. Because I'll tell you one thing, brothers and sisters, when we do that, when we let the Spirit, the words of God build us up. When we let those around us build us up, we let the preachers and the words and people say to us, build us up. We let the Holy Spirit build us up. When we let that happen, we can continue to rise and rise and rise. There's no stopping you. There's no, that's when you become in alignment with God. That's when your assignment will be clear. That's when you know where you need to be. That's when you know you're doing the things of God because everything is just crystal clear. It's like the fog just lifted. We just need to make sure we're in the word. We need to make sure we're doing what God has, wants us to do. You know, Joseph, prime example in the Bible. Joseph's brothers hated him. 
They hated him because he was daddy's favorite. Who was daddy's favorite in here? No one? <laughs> I was mama's favorite, so I'm just saying. Dad, dad loved us all as long as we just did what he told us to do. <laughs> but uh, I was mama's favorite. Sorry, brothers and sisters. Suck it up. But uh, we always fight. There's six of us in my family, six kids, and I'm second to the youngest, so do go, Mommy likes you best. Yep. As I used to tell them that all the time, yep, Mom likes me best. You don't like it? Too bad. That's just the way it is. Because you know why? I listened to what she told me. <laughs> I didn't go run my mouth off at her. I said, yes, Mom. Yes, Mom. Yes, Mom. Yes, Dad. Especially the Dad. But uh, always listen to Mom. Always listen to Mom. Now, in 1 Samuel 16, uh, 6 through 13, uh, Samuel anoints David as king. His own dad didn't even call um, David by his name when, were, when um, Samuel, and let's just go there. All right, it's, I'm trying to say it, but it's better if I, we just go there. If I can find 1 Samuel in my Bible. Let's go to 1 Samuel 16. And it's going to be verses 6 through 13. Oh, I'm in 2 Samuel. All right, so it was when they came. Now, this is Samuel. He, he'd gone to Jesse, and he's bringing all the kids before uh, Samuel and, um, and he, to anoint him because God was already cutting David, uh, Saul off. He was like, uh, this guy is not my king no more. He, boop, he's gone. Uh, but he was still king. So it was when they came that he looked at Eliab and said, surely the Lord has anointed is before him. And the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at his physical statue, because I have re refused him. For the Lord does not see as a man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. So Jesse called all his kids. I'm not going to try to say all their names because it would not be good. So he calls all his kids and they all come before, before Samuel and he denies them all. And Jesse's, and, and Jesse's probably going, man, all my kids are failures. What's going on with these guys? None of them are being chosen. But Samuel says, is this all the young men? And then he says, well, there remains yet the youngest. There he is, keeping the sheep. He didn't even call David by name. He called all his other sons by name, but they didn't call David by name. David was just that kid out there in the field who plays on the harp a lot and sings to the sheep. They thought he was kind of woohoo, strange out there. You know, he's doing all this weird stuff out there with the harp of the sheep. Doo -doo -doo -doo. But, uh, you know, he didn't call him by his name. And, and Jesse said, Sing, send and bring him here, for we will not sit down until he comes. And all the brothers were like, really? We can't eat until, Je uh, until David gets here? Really? Man, they were probably upset. I'm like, man, we can't even sit down. We can't even eat. We have to wait for this young punk to come. Now he was ruddy, with bright eyes and good looking. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for, he, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. <laughs> I bet they did not. Oh, I bet they weren't happy about that. Mm, mm, mm. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose and went and he left. Now, at that time, too, the spirit left Saul because God was just fed it with Saul. He, he did not obey and did not listen. Now, you would think, okay, he's anointed king. He's going to go on to the palace. But where did he go? He went back to the field. David, even though he was anointed king, and he knew he was in, now in alignment with God for his future, but he still went out to the field with the sheep. He still kept doing what he's doing. And he kept believing God and kept singing to God and singing to the sheep. And, and there was time where he came and he also sang to Saul and played for him to calm his spirit. And that's when, that's, see, God was setting him up. That's when his time came because that's when he came against David. And you can imagine, here's, here's David. He's out in the field all the time singing, praising God, 
believe, you know, loving on the Lord. And, um, you know, his brother's off to war. And Jesse says, hey, come here. I need you to take some food out, some bread to your, to your brothers. Go feed them. They're, they're, they need food. And he takes it out there. And he's hearing this Philistine just basically cursing God. And David goes, did you hear that? Are you guys hearing that? Did you hear that? What he just said about our God? And the brothers go, yeah, he's been saying that for weeks. And you haven't done nothing? You sat here and let this uncircumcised? You got to understand, uncircumcised, that was like a cuss word. This uncircumcised? Curse our God? Really? You're going to let that go on? And you're just going to stand here? Well, we have no one strong enough. Man, he, was, he got mad. And so, you know, he went to David and, I mean, uh, to Saul. And, then, you know, Saul was trying to put his armor on him and it was too big. And, and David knew who he was because he fought the bear, the lion. He fought all that. God was preparing him during that whole time. He knew who he was. He knew his alignment with God and where his authority and power laid. And God was like, no, 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 no. Take that off. Take that off. He says, I got something better for you. And he just picked up those stones and put one right between that big old boy's head. Right in the head, man. And that big old boy went down and he went over. And that, you know, that's when David picked up a sword. Now, believe it or not, when he was out in the field, when he was fighting the lion and the bear, he never had a sword. He didn't have anything. He knew what he, that slingshot and those five smooth stones, that's all he knew. When he picked up the sword for the first time is when he cut off that big old dude's head at the time. And he carried it around. He carried can you now picture that? He's carrying that head <laughs> into town. Do, 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 do. And everybody's singing for him. He's carrying the head. He probably, and he took the guy's armor too. You know, David was a young kid at this time. And he probably took, you know, as a, as a, uh, as a souvenir, he probably took, you know, Goliath's um, armor and stuff and threw it in his room, kept it. It was his. Took that head and stuck it on a stick, you know. But he let everybody know, and then they went, and they ran the Philistines out and ran into the city. He's going into their cities carrying their, 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 their uh, giant's head, carrying their champion's head, and they all freaked out. There's this little tiny shepherd boy. Now, I'm sure Dave was probably pretty strong. He had to carry that head. That's a big head. There's some big heads I've seen. But anyhow, you know, you got to understand, up until that time, he kept on going into the field. He kept on doing what God told him to do. He kept on doing the shepherding thing. Kept on praising God. That was his preparation time. That was his time to be prepared to go and face his giant. Just like all of us, our preparation time is to be in the word. Is to be before God. Do what he's telling us to do. Go where he tells us to go. Be where he tells us to be. To minister the word of God. To minister to that one person. If there's only one person, you minister to that one person. He, that's preparation time for the things to come. For things to come. And like I said, I never wanted to do worship again. I hate I was. I despise worship. That's how much I didn't want to do it anymore. But when Pastor Andy told me, he says, hey, our worship leader just quit. I need help. He says, could you do it at least for two weeks? All right, I do. You're my cousin. I'll help a brother out. I'll do it for two weeks, but that's it. And then he came back and says, man, just do it. You know you're supposed to be doing it. Just do it. I was like, man, get off me. I don't want to hear this. I don't want to do it. And he says, no, you need to do it. And then we prayed about it. And my wife even said, you know you're supposed to be doing it, right? I go, I don't like you right now. I didn't want to do it. Because I hated what it did to me before. Guys, you don't understand. When I was on worship teams, we cut albums. I, I was in front of thousands and thousands of people. But that wasn't it. See, I thought I, I arrived. I was there. I, I was going to be the next Chris Tomlin. And then it just shoo, fell. But that was still a preparation time. God used that time of me worshiping and learning different styles and being under different leaders and learning to submit. And I had to submit to God. I had to submit to what he told me to do. By faith, I had to take it. Okay, God. And I didn't know 
anybody in this church. We just started coming here. I was like, I don't know anybody. I didn't know Bruce and Tina. We didn't have a, did we have a drummer at the time? Well, we had a drummer at the time when I took over. I didn't know a lot of these people. And I was like, you know, I'm, I'm Andy's cousin. They're going to be like, sure, yeah, he's going to be the worship leader. Why not? He's a cousin. I didn't know these people. I didn't know what they thought of me. But you know what? I had to do what God told me to do. I had to be where he wanted me to be. And by that, it has it's blessed me. It's been, it's been awesome. I've learned a lot of things. These guys have taught me stuff, you know, that I didn't know. They, and I've learned from everybody. So always know there is a preparation time for everything. And it, it will get you a line to where you need to go. I want to go to um, Matthew 9.37. We getting anything out of this? I hope so. Or am I just up here talking to myself again? Because this is ministering to me, even though I wrote, uh, God laid this out for me. It's ministering still to me. Not chapter 9, verse 37. Now, before I go to that, <clears throat> gotcha, God just reminded me of something. Before I go to that, each one of us, God is called, Right? But before we were born, he put a calling on our lives. Now it's up to us to choose to follow or not to follow. We've been marked. We've been marked by God to do what God has called us to do. And we have to know his anointing is on us for these times. Guys, we live in a great time. People think, how can you say that? The world's going to hell in a handbasket. Yeah, it is. I'm not going to deny that. I mean, in California, you can get arrested if you're a server and go to jail for giving someone a straw. But they'll let an illegal come in and kill someone and slap their hand and send them back home. How stupid can you be and still breathe? But that's, what, that's kind of where we live in, guys. That's kind of where we live. We are marked for this time. We are prepared for this time. God has chosen us for this time to go and spread the gospel. We are marked. We have that seal of approval on us from God. So we need to be ready to go when he tells us, because the heart, like in uh, chapter 9, verse 37, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Guys, there's not a lot of laborers out there. There's a lot, not a lot of people in the church that's willing to go and do what God's called. Now, not in this church. In this church, I know there's people that are willing to go and do and, and, and obey God. And go. That's one thing I love about the college. When you're second year, you have to go on a missions trip. You have to. It's required if you want to graduate. You have. And I know stories upon stories of people who attended here who did not want to go on a missions trip. They were fearful. When they came back, their lives were rocked and changed. Well, the, uh, well, uh, Chris, Lisa and, and uh, Chris. Lisa did not want to go. But now look at there in Scotland and love and life. Love and life. I, I didn't particularly want to go to Nicaragua. I was like, God, I can go to Italy. I could go to Germany. I knew those places. I was in the military. I've been there before. But, you know, then God was like, no, I don't want you to go there. I want you to go to a third world country, the poorest in the world, and see the trash and see the d dilapidated buildings. Go there when there's a riot. Get rocks thrown at you. You know, feel like you're in L.A., you know, but I did, and I fell in love with it. I fell in love with it. Those people and those kids down there, they are awesome. And we're going back. We don't know when, but we're going. I'm going to take my wife this time. But I told her, we go down there, her grandma heart's going to come alive, <laughs> and she's not going to want to leave. I just know it. Because the ladies that are on our team, even the guys, this is one, there's this one guy down there who has a baby named after him who was on our team when we went to mission, on the mission trip because he baptized that child and prayed for it. And, then, and they, I guess they don't name their kids right away down there. I didn't know that. I think it like, takes like 30 days before they name a child. And so they're like, through an interpreter, we like to name him Mark. And he was like, okay. And tears is rolling. You no, know, you're touching people's lives when you obey God and you get in that alignment with God's life for you. You're doing what God's telling you to do. We're not too old. We're not too young. 
It doesn't matter who we are financially, physically. When God says do it, just do it. Because he's trying to get something through you. He's trying to get something to you and through you for the people he's trying to minister to. We've got to be obedient to what God has called us to do because we are marked. We are sealed by the Holy Spirit. We are marked by God for this time of age, this time right now, for these people on this earth. We are marked to minister the gospel and the love of Jesus Christ to the world. Let's go over to Matthew 10.1. And when he had called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out, to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of diseases. He gave them power. He, he, gave, he didn't do power into them at that time. He was still on earth, but he gave them that anointing, that power to do it. Guys, we have that power through the Holy Spirit. We can do that. How fun it is to do it, too. Let me tell you, when you see someone get healed, when you see a leg grow out, when you see ears pop open, when you see things like that happen. When I was in Nicaragua, I saw this lady, I, a little lady. She says she couldn't move her shoulder. She couldn't lift it up above this. And prayed for her through an interpreter. Prayed, speaking in tongues transcends all languages. It does. It doesn't matter if you're speaking Spanish, Portugal, German, Russian. It doesn't matter. Holy Spirit transcends all that. He, he gets past all those barriers. And I just laid hands on her, and I knew she was healed. And I said, through the interest, I said, do something you can never do before. And she went like this. I, she was healed right then. When you see those kind of things happen, the lady came up to me. I prayed for her ankle. She couldn't even walk. She started walking, kind of running. And it had been hurt. She hurt like four months prior. Little kids coming up. I know some of my team members were telling me, little kids come up who couldn't hear, started hearing. That's what we are marked for, guys. That's what we are called to do. We are called to spread this gospel of the good news to the people around the world, to heal, the, heal people, to help them, to show the love of God. Just going up and hugging them is healing for some. That's all they want. That's all they want. They've never had anyone just really just hug them and say, I love you. They've never really had that. That's all they want. Just go up and hug them. You'd be amazed. Or you go up and give someone 50 bucks, and it just blows their mind. They're like, what? Why are you giving this to me? And I don't know them from Adam because God said so because he loves you. And it just blows their mind <sighs> because that's not how the world is. Some try, but they do it under, under their own power and so they can feel good. I do it because God gets the glory. That's why I do it. He's the one I do it for, not for myself. Yeah, it feels good. I'm not going to lie. It feels good. But ultimately, it's him. When they see Jesus through me and saying, because Jesus loves you, here you go. Jesus loves you. That's all it is. And that's what we're marked to do, guys. The, the devil's going to turn up the pressure, guys. He's going to turn up the heat on us. But we just got to know who we are in Jesus Christ. We got to keep that alignment. We got to keep focused on that prize. We got to keep focused on what God's called us to do. And when we do, we can't go wrong. We'll never go wrong. Never. It's when we turn our eyes away. Like I did after was that time. There was a time of year right there. I turned my eyes away and I was like, I'm done with this. I'm going to do my own thing. But when God got a hold of my life in 2016, says, I want you to go to college, Bible college, I was like, I hate school. I don't want to go to school. I hated school, guys. It wasn't for my wife, I wouldn't have graduated. We met in high school. If it wasn't for her, I wouldn't have graduated. There's no way. She said, if you want to be around me, you got to study with me. Well, I wanted to be around her. <laughs> so I studied with her and graduated on the principal's honor list. Before that, I was failing, failing bad. I was, I was having a fun time in high school. You know, that's what you did in high school, right? I, I knew uh, if I went to college, I would have been a wreck. <sighs> <laughs> but you know what? You know, I did what I had to do. And now we got to do what we have to do. You know, there's those who are just going to church on Easter and Christmas. And those are the ones that we need to reach to, guys. It's, it's the church, too. We need to reach the church. There's a lot of people sitting in churches that don't have no power, don't know the real love of God. They just know they need to be there. 
Maybe if I punch my Christian clock there, I'm going to get into heaven. God loves them. And they probably are born again, truly born again. And they're going to heaven. But what, what a miserable life to live. Not to be flown in the anointing of God. Not be in alignment with God and his assignment for your life. Not being able to do what he's called you to do because you don't know anything else. All you know, I go to church, I sit there for 30 minutes, and I'm gone. That's not, that's not what God intended. You know, the, there's power in our words, too. When we speak the, the words of God, there's power in those words. Just like we spoke to these fires that were up here. We spoke to those fires, and they burned back on themselves. And rain came, and it still is coming. We spoke to that fire down there in, in La Vida Pass. And it finally, man, it, the word just finally whoosh, come upon that fire. And it's going out. The same thing we can do to Redding, California. We can speak to that fire. We can speak to it because, you know what? If they want to give things names, it said every name has to bow at Jesus. If they want to give things, if they want to give hurricanes names. I remember growing up, you know, they say, oh, there's a snowstorm coming in. You know, they're giving these things names too. Snowstorms, I'm like, really? You want to give it a name? Well, I'll speak to it. If you want to give it a name, it has to bow at the name of Jesus. You want to give it a name? No problem. We'll speak to it. We have that power, guys. We have that power. We have the power, like Mark 11, 22, you know, the faith of God. We have the faith of God. We have the power of God. We have the anointing of God. We are in line with God. Once we get in line with God and his assignment for our lives, you can't go wrong. It's just we have to hook up. Now, it may seem like, but I'm not hearing anything. I'm not feeling anything. It's not by your feelings. I can get goosebumps all day long, but that doesn't determine anything. It's what I have to know inside what God has told me. i got to know it without a shadow of a doubt. When God tells me to do something, no matter how comfortable it is, no matter how much it costs me, because, God, you know my bank account. You know what's in there, and you're telling me to do what? But I know when God says to do something, I just do it. And he provides it. He, he's there with me. He's already gone before me. As long as I abide in him and do what he says, man, I can't go wrong. Will it always be easy? Nope. And that's, that's a misnomer some Christians get. Oh, I'm a Christian now. Life's going to be easy. Nope. Life is not going to be easy. And there's those of you sitting in this room, you can testify to that. Life is not easy. Life is not. But you know what? With the power of God in us and his love and his grace upon our lives, as long as we keep focused on that, he'll get us through everything. We don't need to try to find ways to go around things. We just need to go through it. You know, like the Psalms 23, through the shadow, through the valley of the shadow of death, well, if there's a shadow, there's a light. That's the only way a light, a shadow can be cast. Because God is shining his light upon us as we're going through things. He's guiding us. He's got us. He's got us. We don't need to be worried about anything. The devil, now, the devil wants us to worry, and the world will tell us to worry. That's why I don't, I don't um, listen to those uh, commercials anymore. We don't even hardly watch TV, regular TV, because the commercials like, if you take this medication, you could die but it's supposed to help you with these other things. Why listen to that? Why listen to it? I'm not taking it. I'll deal with it. But that's the world. They have, they have doom and gloom upon them, and that's not how God wants us to live. <sighs> I think I got it through. Well, I hope you got something out of this. Like I said, it was ministering to me, and I, I read this last night. I was like, God, just let your word, just let you flow through me. Because I'm not one who can stand up here and, like Andy, and give all the Hebrews and Greek and all that stuff. I try to say those words, and it's just not good, y'all. I'm from the South, and so <laughs> it's not good. <clears throat> so I don't, don't even try. But the Word of God, like I was telling you before, this is your decision book. This is where you find your answers. This is where our life lies. And all we have to do is just be in this daily, hourly. Let it just reside. Let it come up within our spirit. Let the Holy Spirit remind us of those things that we need to be reminded of. Those scriptures that we need at the time we're going through something. 
let this, let this be your guide. Let this be your manual of life. Because once we do, we can never go wrong. And even if we make a mistake, who cares? Learn from it and go on because God's got you. He's got our back. He loves us. I love you. And I pray for you every day. I pray for this church. I pray for Pastor Andy and Sheriff's because, man, when we got each other's back and we've got God's got our back, nothing can come against us. We just got to keep that shield of faith up. Keep it up. Don't get weary and drop it. Keep it up. Keep it up. Even though you're getting tired and that armor is heavy, keep it up. Keep it up. Amen? Amen? Father God, I just thank you for your word. I thank you, Father God. Your word comes and it speaks to us. And it does not return to you void. Father, it comes and it just teaches us. It shows us the things that we need to know. This book is a decision book. And Father God, let it be the most important book we ever read. Let it be the most important book that we ever know. Beyond anything, Father God, this book is where our life lies. This book, Father God, is where we get our guidance. This book, Father God, is where we find our wealth. This book is where we find our healing. This book, Father God, is where we find salvation for others. And you showed us and lead us. This is our roadmap. Father God, I just love you and praise your holy name and give you all the glory and the honor and the praise. And Father God, as we align ourselves with you, our alignment determines our assignment. And Father God, you have an assignment for each and one of us. Each one of us has an assignment. Let us now become just like David. Let us just be aligned with you, Father God. Yes, he went through trials and tribulations. But as, we're, as long as we're aligned with you, Father God, they can't knock us down. They can't bring us down, but Lord, it can bring us up if we let it. It can bring us up. Bring us up closer to you to that higher level of our calling in Christ Jesus. Father God, I just give you glory and honor and praise. In Jesus' name. If there's anybody here who needs any kind of ministry, healing, salvation, anything, we, we love, I would love to just be here and pray with you, be in agreement with you, like Andy says, Pastor Andy says. We don't sit up here and boo-hoo with you and cry over things, but we believe the word and we command the word to do what it's called to do. Amen? Yes. Yes, testimonies. Come on up.